Greetings, everyone. I'm Larry Williams, the director of KARMA, the Consortium for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis. Uh, it is January 23rd, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another uh, version of Meet the Methodologist, uh, our chance to uh, converse, learn, and uh, benefit from the wisdom and experience of distinguished methodologists. And it's a real pleasure today to be here with Mike Pratt, uh, who will be coming to Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, to give a webcast uh, this Friday uh, on January the 25th. So you know, may know that Mike is the O'Connor Family Professor and Director of the PhD program at Boston College's Carroll School of Management. Uh, you may also know he's a past associate editor of the Academy of Management Journal and a current associate editor of Administrative Science Quarterly and many other accomplishments that uh, we won't uh, take the time to celebrate. But uh, we do appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today, Mike. And we're very grateful to uh, that you'll make the long trip from Boston to Lincoln uh, for your webcast this weekend. So welcome back to Karma, Mike Pratt. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yep, yep. So Mike, um, you go to grad school at the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, what were the experiences that you had there that shaped your interest and in your approach to the topic of research methods? Uh, so that's a good question. I, I think I was, you know, uh, interested in qualitative methods probably from undergrad, just the kind of studies that I was, you know, that I resonated with or were attracted to. But when I got to Michigan, there was really nobody doing qualitative methods there at the time, or if they were, they had just started. Um, but luckily for me, probably my second or third year, Anat Raffaelli came visiting to University of Michigan. I said, or not, I really want to, you know, I really want to study emotions. I like how you study. I like how you study them. He said, Mike, I am tired of emotions. So if you want to do something else, that's fine. So uh, and that's just, you know, if you know a not, not is very straightforward. He says, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Are you interested? I didn't really have another idea. She said, how about organizational dress? I said, okay. Those who don't do write about it, right? So like, I'm not a snappy dresser. So I said, why not? Um, but we got started on some studies, you know, and so then I, I got more interested in qualitative methods. Um, there weren't any classes on it in the business school. I took one in sociology, um, which was interesting, but not particularly, it was a lot of hand, it was a lot of experiential stuff with not a lot of content around it. So uh, eventually for my dissertation, uh, I asked Martha Feldman to be on my dissertation committee. Uh, and she, along with Jane Dutton, both helped me really kind of learn by doing. It was a very much of an apprentice model, both in the knot, um, or with the knot and Jane and Martha. And, you know, since then, I've, you know, I, I've been trying to, you, I try to learn a lot more. There's many more resources today than there, than there was when I was in graduate school about how to actually do this stuff. Yeah. So uh, you come out of uh, Michigan then, and I think you spent several years at the University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. and so um, that was uh, uh, an, an interesting time in terms of the the emergence of an increased interest in qualitative research yep. methods. So what it coming out with kind of that type of identity or orientation? What do you remember about what that was like? Um, it was a fun time to be. Well, I was lucky. I mean, and I think a lot of, I think you have to know in this field, there's the hard work and luck. I was lucky that qualitative methods were becoming a little bit more acceptable and identity was hitting. So I kind of like, that was two things going my way. Um, going to Illinois though was interesting because I was the only person doing qualitative research. Uh -huh. I think one thing we talked about the other day, like how did you, like what got you interested in methods and like writing about methodology? Part of it was um, I had to teach other people. Uh, if I wanted to go up for tenure, I wanted people to understand the research that I did. Mm -hmm. I not only need to know how to do it, but I need to be able to explain to the people who I'm working with. And so I was the qualitative guy for, you know, a long time. I had people come in and out that were qualitative, but in general, that was it. So it really kind of forced me to be much better on my game. Um, coming out with a qualitative dissertation, I won't give the year, but at that time was a pretty risky strategy. Yeah. I remember being at a job talk 
and just people giving me this look, like, you know, what are you doing? And I finally said, how many people here know anything about qualitative methods? And nobody raised their hand. I said, uh -huh. okay, let's stop. And I, and I started doing a qualitative methods primer right there in the middle of my job talk. Uh -huh. it, not, at, not, at, not at Illinois, but at another, another place. And so, it, you know, part of my interest in methodology came out of not having resources, immediate resources around me, especially at Illinois, to, to, to do what I was doing. Um, and other people that would understand what I was doing. So, so that, yeah. that was kind of a, that was a big impetus. Yeah. You know, what I um, remember as I became more involved in the research methods community about that time was that there was a fair amount of tension uh, between folks based on which particular approach that they took and that there was also a lot of ignorance that I can only say from the quantitative side, ignorance amongst my quantitative friends about anything having to do with qualitative methods. So, but it, my sense is that it seems like today that that's much less true. Yeah, and, and, I would and agree. If so, what do you think are kind of the things that help bring things together? I think a few things happen. One is, um, I think more people are doing it. So I feel like I'm like maybe third generation qualitative, you know, maybe uh -huh. John Van Manen and then, you know, some of his students and not Raffaele, Bob Sutton, and then like Kim Elsbach and I would probably be like, an, like another generation. So we had, we had people before us who were, who had been, you know, did a nice job of kind of paving the way. Um, the other thing I think the big, I could, to me, the real, the big game changer was actually getting qualitative editors at journals. Uh huh. Because that really, I think, signaled legitimacy to the field um, and getting more qualitative people on, on editorial review boards. Because once that's in place, it's kind of a signal to the field, number one. And, and then it's also easier to publish. If people, you know, if you're sending something to a journal and they actually know what, their, what the methodology is, it helps, you know, it was also helpful in that way. So more people then started, they saw this signal, more people who were doing qualitative stuff, I think, started sending into journals. Um, the Academy of Management, I think, around this time was really helpful. Uh, yeah. Research methods division in particular had started having all these ask, ask the experts qualitative. They used to have yep. ask, ask the experts quantitative. This is way back. Yep. And now you can't go to the academy without half dozen qualitative methods, PDWs, pre, pre academy. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, I think the methods division has come a long way towards. Uh, bringing that together, but you were in that role at the AMJ, right? Yep, I was. I was that the first qualitative editor there. Yeah, that must be a pretty rewarding thing to look back on, thinking about having the opportunity to shape uh, all parts of the process in that way. Yeah, I might start shaping is the right word, or like keeping my head above water. But it was, it was, it was a phenomenal time because uh, at that moment, at that point. I was the only qualitative person. So I got micro, macro, strategy, you name it. If it was qualitative, it came my way. But it was like being in graduate school again. I got three, probably, as, I haven't read that broadly probably since comprehensive exams. So it was a lot of fun for me. Um, but it was also great because, you, you know, you, you do this job and you get into conversations with people about what's important, what's it like, you know, what do you need to publish these things? And we started having conversations about it. And I think, and those conversations have become, from the editors, things and book chapters, and so we kind of kind of spun out from there. But yeah, it was it was a an, it was an amazing time, intense though. A lot of a lot of papers came through at that point. Yeah, yeah. So how do you think that your work as an editor uh, uh, with AMJ and even continuing to this with ASQ, how has that shaped you as a in your own research in your own writing? You, were there lessons that you learned being an editor that kind of helped make you, you think, a better researcher and writer? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think in general, it's easier to look at other people's papers and see the flaws in them sometimes on your own because you're so close. So when you get, I think I've now decisioned 500 manus qualitative manuscripts, probably more than that. I've just seen a lot. Like I know what mistakes now to avoid. Um, I start seeing patterns about good ways to do things, not good ways to do things. Um, so it's really been, it's been very helpful. I mean, in some ways it is, it's been transformative to be able to just kind of see how people do this, how people craft and learning. I mean, the nice thing about editors, you learn as you go along. You learn from the, you learn from your, the, your authors. Because um, if you do this, I think, right, it's really, 
too much. You know, it's their paper. You're kind of, you should be more of a midwife than a, than anything. And you're just, and you learn from them as they're working through their own, their own issues. But, um, mm -hmm. but there's a paper I wrote for him on, in, for organization research methods. It was, it was essentially just like learning lessons from it being a quality of editor on how to publish. And that's been really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, given your particular uh, perspective, uh, are there things like that you understand about our profession now that you didn't coming out that you wish you would have? You about know, the profession or about publishing or about, about what, what more specifically? It could be about anything in it. It could be about teaching. It could be about mm -hmm. research. You know, we kind of come out at least this was true for me. You come out of school as a graduate student and, you know, you think that the few years as a graduate student that you understand a lot and then you get on the other side of, of the desk and into it all and you come to realize that things, for some of us, things are different than what we thought. Oh my goodness. I mean, this is only a short interview. I, that could be a, that could be well, like a multiple volume book about things I didn't know coming out of graduate school. Well, I think I was, I think I was pretty inexperienced in uh, uh, coming out and maybe some, maybe naive, but so it's, I mean, certain things I've learned, I'll, I'll break it down. It's like in terms of uh, research, I think I've learned a lot about how to get at questions, what are interesting, um, to be guided by fundamental questions rather than by theories. So I'm interested a lot in how people connect with their work, how people connect with their organization. So my antenna are always out now rather than sitting down and figuring out what I'm going to do. So it, I think it's, I'm more efficient than I used to be. Um, I was across the hall at Illinois from Greg Northcraft when he was the editor at AMJ. Uh -huh. Here's what I wish I learned well, much earlier in my career. He goes, Mike, editors accept papers, not reviewers. So I, I, you spent all this time trying to get reviewer three on your side. But in fact, you really need to get the editor on your side because at the end of the day, they're making the decision. Um, that was a very pragmatic piece. Um, I think for teaching, the biggest thing there is that number one, you don't have to teach everything in a book. So I used to teach intro to OB and I felt compelled that there was 15 motivation theories, gosh darn it, I will teach all 15 motivation theories. I gotta be complete. Uh -huh. um, and as I've gone on, I think I teach fewer things in more depth. Uh -huh. I bring my own research into it. I think I'm a much more effective researcher if I can bring somehow my own experiences, my own research into the work that I do. Lovely thing about being qualitative, doing qualitative research is I have a ton of stories. Yeah. You want a motivation story? I have it. So I may be teaching something and I have a story for it. I just got done teaching negotiations and I put a whole section in there on intractable identity conflicts because I've done research on it. it there wasn't any negotiations textbook. But it really, I think it made the class better and it made me more involved in the class. Oh, yeah. so. oh, that's very cool. That's very cool. I think maybe I see that like in my, uh, in my own teaching, like in the method stuff that I do. When I'm talking about methods or quantitative topics where I have done research and I can bring that in, uh, I think it definitely brings out something in me that's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, that that can have some uh, some positive effects. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, the teaching. One of the things that that people struggle with oftentimes is how they balance the responsibilities for teaching versus their research. Mm -hmm. And do you have any particular strategies about uh, how you do that uh, that you think have worked or things that you've tried that haven't worked? Yeah, no, um, because some of it goes back to what did you use, use these, uh, what le uh, learning lessons. So uh, one of the first learning lessons that I, I think that I had was, was around teaching and how to teach. Um, one thing that I've learned is I, 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 so I both, I compartmentalize and I integrate at the same time. Compartmentalize in the sense of the kind of research I do usually takes big chunks of time. I'm out in the field, I'm doing interview. So I usually stack my teaching into one semester if you can do it. Mm -hmm. um, I realized that number of classes are not as important as number of preps. So yeah. I'd rather have two classes with one, or three classes with one prep than two classes with two preps. Um, 
uh, as a, you know, that, that was another important thing. But again, as I said before, I think the big thing about teaching was integrating with my research and not seeing it as a competition. Because mm -hmm. I think the other thing in our field, teaching is one of these things that gives you immediate feedback, good or bad. Either the students are sleeping or they're excited or somewhere in between. My paper is not that way. So I'm, I was, especially early on, it's, it's the tyranny of the urgent, right? So if a student needs your help, I'm on it. So it, it's so what I what I found is that I I find teaching very seductive in a good in a good way and a bad way. Um, mm -hmm. I'm getting immediate feedback. I'm spending a lot of my time in it. I see a lot of junior faculty. All of their time goes into teaching because that's where they're getting the feedback. And yeah, I'll get to my research papers later because no one's bothering me about it, but somebody's bothering me on the email. So yeah. learning how to create appropriate boundaries with your students about yeah. okay, I'll you know I like so what I'll do is I'll, I may teach on a Monday and a Wednesday. And have Tuesdays where my office hours are, so I I bound in in the week, um, and I you know, but I don't have people come in on Friday or Thursday or Friday. I just kind of try to block that out. Yeah, uh, yeah. And do you, you uh, do you have a set place? Do you have oh, a set place that you write? Uh, yeah, I I write in my office. I have three kids, and so even though they're teenagers now, they don't talk as much nearly as now. We I want them to talk more than they do. <laughs> um, but when they were younger, they weren't talking, they were talking a lot. So I find, um, I come to the office early. I stay till about dinner time, but I'm out when I'm home, I'm all in. So one way I manage work and family is I love being a dad. I coach, I've coached soccer. I've coached basketball. Um, I've done a lot of things with my kids, but, um, when I was younger, I think I would bring more work home. Yeah. Now I get in early, get it done. And then I would do nighttime routines. My wife would do morning routines, so I would be up. I was never a morning person, but now, like to me, six o'clock in the morning, sleeping in, which is you asked me that in graduate school. That's when I was going to bed. Like I was going to bed at five or six. But now that's when I got up. I got work done then, and then I'm you know I go home, and then I'm all in at home on the weekends. I'm all in on the weekends. So yeah, um, I think a lot of this job is just figuring out prioritizing what's important to you, and then bounding it in such a way that it works for you. So you're teaching your research and your home life um, don't have to necessarily all be in competition, but you do have to know how to prioritize and how to essentially arrange your life, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I always try to, to share with people that I think that they have to find their own way. You oh know, yeah. The, the strategies that other people use, some of them may work, some of them may not. And part of what has to go on earlier in your career is kind of learning what you are going to be and how you're going to go about being. Yep. So, well, you're coming in here to talk about, uh, to give a webcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, the webcast, uh, for those of our our viewers here that don't know about that, Karma, we bring in a uh, distinguished methodologist during the years and give a webcast that's live over the internet and the recordings then are available. Tell us a little bit about your topic for uh, Friday, Mike. Okay. So I want us to kind of look at method sections, particularly qualitative method section, and go back to what, like, what are the purpose? Why do we have them in a paper in the first place? And I'm going to argue it's to create a sense of trustworthiness that I think I know what you're doing. Um, so I'm going to talk about how that's complicated in qualitative research because there's not a lot of agreement on what makes for good qualitative research. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of four parts. First part is, you know, the, the, the importance of being trustworthy in your, in your research. Then I'm going to talk about these two camps. One that, that kind of has, you know, qualitative research should be judged by criteria pretty similar to quantitative. And other people are saying, you know what, we need to have an entirely new set of criteria. So how that's kind of developed in our field. And then the latest development has been qualitative templates. Maybe that's our solution. We need to have a qualitative template. People do things in a similar way. They can be judged easier. But I'm going to talk about the problems with that. And then I'm going to talk about what I think is the solution to all these problems. I'm not going to tell you what that is because no one will tune in tomorrow, but so, <laughs> stay tuned. Well, you've, got, you've got my interest, uh, that's for sure. So um, finally, the one thing uh, that I'd also like to mention is that uh, Karma does research method short courses, and, and that includes qualitative courses. And Mike, you've been uh, a contributor from the beginning. And of course, we're excited to be in the planning stages to come back to Boston College the week of June 10th. Tell us a little bit about the short course that, that you teach. So I teach, um, it was it's originally called the ethnography class, but as I, it's evolved over time, it's really kind of an intro to qualitative methods. Mm -hmm. Because it, it starts with, it, it takes you, it's two and a half days, it's intense. 
Um, but it starts with how do I think about what is qualitative research? How is it different from quantitative? How do I design my study? Then I have you, all this is workshoppy. So I don't just talk about this stuff, you actually do it. I'll say, how do you do interviewing? We'll practice interviewing, we practice observations. All about collecting data. Then we'll spend a half a day or more on how do you analyze the data? And then we end with how do you write this stuff up? Because you can do a lovely study, but if you can't write it up for a journal, it's gonna sit in your desk. So that's, it kind of takes you to kind of get the, 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 the basic logics and basic tools you need to do qualitative research. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, we're very, uh, just very honored that uh, you're coming back to give another webcast and also for your ongoing support with our short course program. And uh, I am very much forward to look, looking forward to hanging with you this time tomorrow afternoon. So safe travels and thanks a lot, Mike Pratt. Sounds good. Good to see you. See you, right. see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.